All right, hello everyone. I'm Cody Wild, as is mentioned, and I am one of the authors on this paper, a deep learning approach to fast, sorry, fast format agnostic detection of malicious web content. And so I'm speaking on behalf of the Sophos data science team, who are the ones to put this model together. All right, so before we dive into technical details, let me give you a little bit of a background on the problem that we'll be solving. So it's not entirely clear from the title, but our goal here is to detect malicious HTML. So all web content is ultimately rendered in the form of HTML. And the kinds of malicious behavior that we really care about, these are things like cross-site scripting or drive-by downloads, these kinds of functionality are facilitated through JavaScript. And this is because these are trying to not be detected by the blacklist systems that make up a lot of malware detection. They're often obfuscated, often randomized, and they're often a small script embedded in an otherwise benign page. The other main constraint that we're operating under is that we're in industry. We're not just building this model as a theoretical tool. We want to deploy this at scale. We want to have a model that can score millions of web pages in an hour. So we need it to be fast, we need it to be scalable. Oh, I apologize, this got cut off here. Um, so what this says is that systems that do explicit parsing of the HTML tree or that explicitly try to identify and emulate JavaScript behavior by pulling it out of an HTML system are often slow, or at least slow at the scale we're talking about. These things run in tenths of seconds rather than milliseconds. And so for our purposes, we really wanted to see if we could work with something faster. Uh, another key reason that we wanted to avoid emulation and parsing systems for this project is that they you know, inevitably are going to introduce assumptions, and assumptions are inevitably going to be brittle. And even if you have a really great parsing system that's really flexible, you know, it's inherently going to mean that there might be some systems you can't parse correctly. And so one of our goals for this project was to determine how well we could do as a performance baseline without using any of these kind of domain knowledge-based systems with a kind of pure tokenized and deep learning approach. All righty. So I might see if I can, give me one second here. I might modify this so that it's a little easier to see because it's for some reason cutting off. Great. Apologies for that. All right. So our conceptual goals were to identify patterns in tokens that correspond to malicious scripts, and to be able to do that regardless of the full HTML document size where that script's embedded. But because of these concerns I mentioned about robustness and computational efficiency, we want to do that without any parsing of the HTML or explicit emulation or parsing out of where the JavaScript is within the HTML. So you can think that if we could explicitly parse out of the JavaScript, and that's a pretty small script, we might be able to use, for example, uh, you know, a CNN, a dilated CNN, an RNN, something that works well on these small word level data. But because we don't want to use parsing for speed reasons, we need to do something that works on the tokens of a full document. And in a full document, word level modeling is typically too slow and needs to learn too long of dependencies to be uh, workable for our circumstances. So the technical approach we used here was a set of shared weights that are applied hierarchically to different levels of aggregation in the document. So like many one sentence summaries, it doesn't give you a really good idea of what we're doing but hopefully by the end of the talk, that sentence will make a little bit more sense. All right, so at least for me, I know I like to understand what kinds of data are actually being put into this model, so I wanna give you a brief background of that first. So we utilize data from VirusTotal, which is a uh, website within the malware vendor community that aggregates the opinion of the vendors as to the maliciousness or not maliciousness of suspected files. Now, all we have here are the opinions of a number of different vendors. We don't have the truth. The truth is often very hard to acquire in malware detection. So what we did was a consensus verdict. If more than three vendors detected, or sorry, more than two, equal to three vendors detect a file as malicious, we label it malicious. If none detect, we label it benign. If only one or two detect, we consider that indeterminate. Now because this label is a little bit arbitrary, it's based on sort of stability of detection over time, but it is ultimately a, a line in the sand that we drew, we also pulled out these functionality or malware family tags out of virus real data. So whenever a vendor detects, it gives its opinion as to what functionality or what malicious functionality it thinks is contained within the file. And so by having this auxiliary information, we can learn a little bit more clearly um, what kinds of functionality, by, by grouping these kinds of functionalities across vendors, we can learn, well, maybe this one vendor considers you know, unwanted files to be malicious and another one doesn't, and so we can separate out things that were just unwanted from true bad functionality by using these auxiliary tags and that'll come up later in our auxiliary loss function. So in terms of parsing, we tokenize the data by splitting out into word characters or Unicode character strings. So we split on spaces, on uh, carrots, on 
uh, yeah, white space and carrots and dashes. And we, so we end up with a set of tokens for each document. Then in order to get a fixed width, a fixed width, fi fixed width representation to put into our model, we perform length-based hashing. So what this just means is that we take the length of the token, so let's call that L for the moment, and then we integer round that down with a max of eight. So we basically group the tokens according to how long they are. And then within these groupings based on length, we hash the tokens and then hash those into buckets by taking the integer hash and doing the mod of that with some number. So that means that we have 128 hash buckets for small string, for, for strings between log zero and log one length, 128 buckets for log one to log two length, and so on and so forth. In equation form, it looks like this, where you multiply the length, of the, the rounded length of the token, and then add the integer hash mod 128. Once we have this mechanism for turning tokens into indexes, we basically do a bag of words or bag of tokens count, but we do it in a very special way, which is that we subdivide the document into 16 consecutive regions, each of size length of the document divided by 16 and then calculate the aggregate counts in each of those regions with the indexing scheme above. So instead of getting one bag of token counts for the entire document, we have bags of token counts corresponding to the first 16th of the document, second, so, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, each document becomes represented by 16 of these 1024 length vectors, which represents the counts for a portion of the document. So one of our clear failings in this paper was to not come up with a snappier name, for which we apologize. But uh, our working name for this model is the hierarchical inspector model, and that'll become kind of clear why in a moment. So reiterating myself a little bit here, but just to drive the point home, the key ideas of this model are to identify potential patterns of malicious tokens that occur at multiple levels of aggregation gr granularity, but to do so efficiently by using the same set of shared parameters to process each level of aggregation. All right, so when I say multi-level aggregation, what do I mean by that? So what I mean is that we start out with, as you can kind of see in pink here, apologies, PDF rather than PowerPoint is making this difficult. All right, we started with 16 vectors. Each represents 1 16th of the document. And then we average those in groups of two to get eight vectors, each representing 1 8th. This pattern continues as you might expect up until we average all 16 together to get a single vector representing hash counts over the full document. So you can kind of think of these as spanning the space that exists between word level modeling on one hand and then full document level modeling on the other hand. So each of these chunks represents a smaller and smaller and more granular view onto the document as a whole. Once we have these aggregations, we put them into what we call the inspector network. I apologize, this is probably a little bit difficult to see on the slide up here, but these 31 input vectors are the 31 aggregations that I just mentioned, the 16 sixteenths, the 8 eighths, 4 fourths, and so on and so forth. And because we did averaging, each of these vectors has a, share, has a magnitude that is equivalent for each document. Um, we also do layer norm on the first layer, so they're equivalent across documents. But in general, these aggregations can be processed by the network as being representations uh, along the same magnitude, and so we can apply the same weights to them. And so that's what we do. We have this two-layer block of, net of network, which is just layer norm, ReLU, and dropout, and we apply this shared weight scheme to all of the aggregations. So what we end up with are 1024 feature maps, one for each of the 31 input vectors. So then we do max pooling across these. So we get the strongest activation for each feature map, regardless of which aggregation level it appeared at. After that, things are pretty straightforward. We've got your typical uh, ReLU fully connected network that goes from this aggregated vector that kind of pulls information across all of our aggregations, and then we feed that up into our output structure. Uh, the one minor thing to note here is that because these functionality tags multiple can apply to a given document, this isn't actually a softmax, but is multiple categoricals. All right, so that, on a mechanical level, that's what the model does. But, but why, do we design, why did we design it that way? What do we hope it's doing? Our real goal with this model is that multiple levels of, of aggregation mean that if there's a token profile that corresponds to a malicious script, let's say that's of size k, then we want to be able to pull that out and find that regardless of what document size it's embedded in, because in the real world, we won't know. And because we can't explicitly pull out the part that is the script, we have to have a model that can be able to find that pattern and that script regardless of what size of document it's in. So if the document's of length k, 
then a feature map can find that token profile in the fully aggregated vector because the fully aggregated vector just is that script. If the document is eight times as long, then in the full document, it'll be very diluted and that token profile won't activate very strongly. But in one of the smaller aggregations, that might capture almost all of the malicious string token profile and then it can trigger a strong activation there. So let's give some visual intuitions for the slide that I just discussed. So up at the top, we have the input structure that I talked about. So we have these 16 vectors that represent 1 16th, these that represent 1 8th. Note we have 16 of these and eight of these. I just got tired of copy and pasting. Um, but these represent different sizes of snapshot of the document. So let's imagine we have this script, this rainbow script here, and it's embedded in a very small document. So it comprises almost the entirety of the document. Here, the activation pattern that corresponds to that token profile will activate most strongly in the fully aggregated document. Whereas in these little small chunks, each of them will only have a small part of the token profile and thus won't correspond to the kind of whole malicious profile. Uh, by contrast, if you look at the, uh, the case of it being embedded in a much larger file, then if you take the token profile over the full document, it'll be very diluted and you won't get as strong of an activation on that particular token profile. But in a middling size aggregation, you will. And so our real goal is that this, this that uh, a feature map that corresponds to picking up this particular malicious uh, token profile will trigger in similar ways in this case and in this case. And so it can share information across uh, the script being present in different sizes of file. So what were our results? In the world of document modeling, the basic baseline that everyone has to beat is a bag of words model. And so we wanted to try our model and make sure that it did better than a bag of words model. But as I've said, our input structure was this 1024 hash for 16 areas of the document. So it's really 16384 floats of information that we're giving our model. So it seemed a little unfair to just give the bag of words model the 1024 and expect it to do anywhere near as well if we aggregated over the full document. So for the sake of trying to give it an equivalent amount of information, albeit in hashed space rather than in like localization space, we increased our hash bucket size so that we actually had a full hash space of 16384 instead of 1024 and then aggregated that over the full document. So the network gets the same amount of information, but in, it gets it aggregated over the document in terms of more expressive hash spaces rather than in terms of localization. So the main critique we're trying to answer here is, why did, you, why did you need to do all this fancy localization? Just build a big enough hash space bag of words model and it'll do just as well. And it turns out that's not true. We tried XGBoost with grid searched entries and max depth. Uh, and we also tried a neural network of equivalent depth and layer width to our proposed model, but without this fancy inspector component, just a normal fully connected network. And at the deployment regions that we most care about, which are, this is a truncated rock curve by the way, because um, it's, in, it's in log scale because we only really care about the very long tail region and the very low false positive region. But uh, the false positive regions corresponding uh, negative four to negative two, our model pretty convincingly outperforms. Uh, this set of baselines is more designed to test specific ideas that went into our architecture. So the first one, which we call flat sequential, is a response to the idea, Flat 13? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, I have a different time up here, so I was just going off of, okay. Um, so the idea of this very quickly is that uh, it's using the share, same shared weight inspector scheme, but only the 16 original vectors with none of the aggregation vectors. So none of the one eighth, one quarter, or the full document. Uh, and, and we see that that performs less well. So we do see convincing evidence that these higher level aggregations actually do add value. Um, we also tried a feed forward network trained on the full 16384 input vector without shared weights. So there's a weight corresponding to every hash space and every locational space within the vector. And that also did not perform as well. So I'm going to jump over this since I basically just said all of these things, which is basically saying that based on the baselines that we performed, we do have a convincing belief that our architectural changes are adding value in this environment. So reflections taking a step back, there's been a lot of incredible progress in language modeling in the last few years, sequence to sequence modeling, transformer networks, and all of that. But that's mostly been on word level modeling and it's really not workable for the kind of document level models that we need to uh, build for HTML detection. So our, our, our real hope is that this kind of a model structure could provide ideas that could be a bridge between these word level models and the document level models that we really are gonna need to build in order to get our networks to understand uh, information that's out there in the world. And with that, 
I will wrap up. Okay, we have time for a quick question. Okay. So if not, we can probably, if you have questions, you can discuss with Cody offline. 